bandwidth for change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. I'm Brad Fitzpatrick, and it is go time. It's Go Time, a weekly podcast where we discuss interesting topics around the Go programming language, the community, and everything in between. If you currently write Go or aspire to, this is the show for you. All right, everybody, welcome back for another episode of Go Time. Today's episode is number 44, and our sponsors for today are TopTal and Datadog. Today on the show, we have myself, Eric St. Martin. Carlicia Pinto is also on the show. Say hello, Carlicia. Hi, everybody. And Brian Kettleson. Hello. And our special guest today uh, probably needs very little introduction, but a member of the Go team, Brad Fitzpatrick. Hello. Hi, Brad. How are you doing? Pretty good. So for anybody who may not be familiar with who you are, do you want to give kind of a little bit of background on who you are and the things you're working on? Uh, I've been working on Go for, I don't know, maybe five, six years now, I guess. And um, I kind of work on the open source facing part of the public project and the standard library. And I run the build system and kind of touched a little bit of everything over the years. So, yeah. And you're to thank for most of the HTTP stuff. In the yeah, standard. a lot of the standard library, like I did all the HTTP client and server for both HTTP 1 and HTTP 2. And um, DB SQL. Yeah, the database stuff, the um, exec child process stuff, some of JSON, you know, here and there, just cleaning up everywhere. Can't change too much nowadays, but before, uh, before Go 1, you know, things were much more fluid. <laughs> Back in the good old days. Yeah. So you mentioned um, one thing that uh, is interesting. I always find is so there. There seems to be a set of Go team members who work on like internal problems, like Go as it relates to projects inside Google that use Go, and then some team members that seem to focus more on like the external community level stuff. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, like, well, back in the day, there was kind of just you know, first three or four people, and then maybe like eight or nine people, and everyone kind of did everything, including internal stuff and external stuff. But as Go has grown in popularity, both outside and uh, inside Google, we've kind of started to specialize more. So there are definitely some people now who never really go into the open source world, and they kind of stay within Google and um, just work on Google-specific libraries or Google-specific performance problems. Sometimes you'll see people make an appearance in the open source world with like some miscellaneous bug fix or performance improvement. and that was probably their first foray into the public. And, you know, they've been debugging something for weeks internally. So uh, we're trying to, like, change that. So they, the Google-only contributors kind of, like, spend more time in the open source community, like, kind of feeling comfortable there because it's different tooling and different processes and stuff. Um, but uh, we're just kind of getting started on maybe doing that every three months or six months or something, having a, a week or two of what we're calling, like, kickoff time, like when the tree opens again for a new Go release, making sure that the uh, and Googlers internally are also involved with that. Hmm. I've noticed that um, you've you've pretty much become the public face of of open source Go. Any issues that come across, you're the person who's triaging them. Uh, dashboards go down, builders go down. You're, you're the person that everybody's talking to. It's it's uh, interesting to see how that has has shaken out over the years. Is that something that you elected to do? Is that something that you were elected to do, or did it just kind of happen? It kind of happened, and then at some point, um, Russ or Ian or a group of people just kind of officially decided it was so. And I said, okay, well, it's already kind of de facto so, so now it's officially so. But um, that's, <laughs> that's kind of how everything in Go happens. You know, you, you do something long enough and you become the de facto leader. You know, the kind of you touched it last problem. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, that creates a bus factor issue, though, too, sometimes. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's the current problem. I'm, uh, I'm actually having my first child soon here. And so I will be taking some paternity leave and that, uh, that the different type of bus factor, I guess. But I've been trying to ramp up some other people to help take over the builders and dashboards and stuff like that. So that's the best news ever. Right. Yeah, it'll be fun. Although I'm missing, uh, missing GopherCon, but I guess that's a good uh, reason. To, yeah, we'll give you a pass for this one. It's okay. Right? Okay. I just wish uh, it was all live streamed so I could watch it from home. 
It was last year. Oh, was it? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, the the main room, all the keynotes were live streamed. The the side sessions weren't live streamed. But yeah, we're we'll we'll still work out details. We'll probably live stream part of it. Oh well, that's so perfect. we'll give you a pass. Okay. A wedding doesn't count because a wedding you can reschedule. You <laughs> can't reschedule the baby. <laughs> now you okay. can schedule babies. You could have timed the baby, Brad. I know, but you know, I did time it. I guess such that uh, comes out right at like the Go One Nine release. So uh, <laughs> okay. I don't know if that's good or good or bad, but at least during the One Nine release freeze, you know, I will. Uh, I won't have to worry so much about it. So is is the one nine releases code name going to be the same as the baby's name? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like two birds. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. We we haven't really had code names for any of the we other releases, do. so it'd be a little weird to start now. Well, it's, it, you got to start a tradition somewhere. All of you know, everybody else does code names for releases: Zesty Zephyrs and Xenial Xerxes and whatever. I think we need some cool code names in Go. That's what we're missing. File proposal. We have a proposal process. <laughs> yeah, I'll file a proposal. We know what's <laughs> going to happen with that. You lead. <laughs> what, why? Actually, Flames. since Brad is uh, does so much of the work of interacting with people, why don't we talk a little bit about what the process is like for people to contribute? There is a recent blog post by Steve Francia, but I think it's good to discuss it on the air. Uh, by the way, Brad, can you uh, approve my pull request? I just put it in last <laughs> night. <laughs> Please. Well, actually, we don't we don't officially take pull requests yet. That's one thing I need to be working on sometime here. Um, I don't know what it what what is the the thing that I did called. Oh, I, the, I made the a CL change. To dare it. Yeah. A CL. Yeah. What does CL stand for? Yeah. Uh, change list. Change it's actually list. Change just list. like a perforce terminology from back when Google used to use perforce. And okay. I remember we've I, Go is now it's on its like fourth uh, version control system, and I think. Perforce was the first one. It was like Perforce and Subversion, then Mercurial, and now Git. But throughout all these transitions, we keep updating our tools to feel like the original tools. So like all the terminology is still from like way back in the day. It's really kind of weird. <laughs> all right, but let's not strange subjects. Can you subjects? Can you please <laughs> approve it? <laughs> Whatever it's named. The CL. CL. You should probably ping it because. Um, Sometimes I lose things, and this is something I need to fix. I need to fix my dashboards and so everyone could help out and see older things. Right now, unfortunately, a lot of times I only see things that are at the top of my inbox. So if you if you ping it, it'll come back to the top. But. I love how Carlicia <laughs> waits till you're on the air to put you on the spot. So you can't say no live on the radio. Pretty epic. <laughs> and the CL is just to include go time on the, on the website. Oh, you know, I did see that this morning. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's CL number 41146. So go ahead and press the button. <laughs> She's like, we'll wait. I'm at the wrong, co- yeah. I'm at the wrong computer, so. We'll, we'll wait. You're awesome, Carlicia. But in any case, why don't we hear from Brad what the process is like? I mean, you were talking about submitting a proposal. Are there cases where a submit a proposal is not necessary? For example, I submitted that CL, but I had asked Steve Francia, like, hey, can we add it? And he said, yeah, go ahead and submit a change. So I did it. But I didn't go on, on I didn't open an issue. Like, if I hadn't talked to Steve, should I have opened an issue first? How would I or well, just be- submit a CL is fine if it's something super small like that? Yeah, I mean, if it's super small, just do it. And uh, we even made our proposal process be pretty lightweight because we knew that even if we wrote a really uh, formal proposal process, people would ignore it or not read it anyway. So we kind of made the proposal process start out with you just file a bug and start talking. And if we deem that your proposal is like, you know, too complicated and it requires a little bit more formality, then we send you to the, the proposal template and have you write like a formal proposal. But most of the time we just like, immediately say yes or no and we don't make people go through like the whole write a document write a design document phase okay yeah your thing is probably not controversial i imagine someone or me will just click accept later okay thank you well (laughs) so what if it's like i I actually saw something a piece of code that i want to add but i don't i don't even have a use for it personally i just think well we it'd just be complete if he was if he existed (laughs) <laughs> do I when I so <laughs> when I submit a, a proposal, do I need to have like it's a strong use case or if I don't have a use case, can I submit it anyway and just say, hey, I think it, I think it sh- should be here? Uh, we have a, we have a fact 
that I added a while back that was, why isn't X in the standard library? And basically it says we have too much stuff in the standard library and we kind of made a mistake adding so much. So please do not add more stuff to the standard library unless it's like, you know, very, very important. So generally we would say, no, go please add it on GitHub instead. What do you mean add it on GitHub instead? Well, if you, you said like you have something that you want added for completeness, but you don't really have a use case yourself. Yeah. So if you're proposing adding that thing to the standard library, we would probably say no, especially if there's no reason for it and you just want to do it for fun. We don't we don't generally add to the standard library just because we can. But then you said add it somewhere else instead? Yeah, like put it somewhere that you can run go get. Oh. The problem with the standard library is we can't really fix things quickly and we can never change things and we can never remove things. So you're much more flexible if you just add it on GitHub. Like my personal project. Yeah, or if the, um, gotcha. there's other places, you know, there's, you can get a, your own domain name and make like a, a fancy name for it. I have gofor.org for like kind of miscellaneous Go utility functions that I need in lots of projects, but I don't necessarily want to add to the standard library. So oh. I let other people add stuff to gofor.org. Oh, that's cool. I should use mine for that too. I registered gofor AF a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> And I still haven't found a use for it. Ever since I registered that domain name, uh, go and then the number four dot org, I get so much spam from people saying, hey, I have a similar domain name. Are you interested in purchasing this one? And they're all just terrible. Like they're all just like random letters and numbers and gibberish. And I'm like, well, it's true. I did order something that's pretty much gibberish. But no, it's my inside joke. <laughs> I always hate that when people try to sell you them. And the other thing I find, too, is like if you search for a domain, and like you're you're sitting on it, you're like, I wonder if I should buy that. And you go back, it always seems to become like a premium domain with a higher price. And you're like, oh, seriously? Yeah. You, you have to be prepared to buy right then. Otherwise, you're you're at risk of them jacking the price on you. That's yeah, I feel my like problem. If you, if you search through the uh, register search form, then they know. You know, you have to like search via, you know, like who is directly or something. So they don't know that you're searching for it. Shopping th for domains through who is first. Yeah, so... Search for it on, on the terminal. I always go to the registrar with my credit card. <laughs> so um, you had mentioned the the one nine release too. Um, what are some of the things that you're working on specifically for one nine? Anything you can talk about yet? I'm actually seeing how little code I can touch in the in the tree for one nine. A lot of stuff I'm doing this cycle is really about um, getting the community more involved in bug triage and uh, code review triage. Because as, um, as Go grows, both internally and externally, the number of bug reports we get and the number of changes that people send in um, just keeps growing. And it doesn't really scale when there's only a couple of us doing reviews because we spend all of our time you know, triaging bugs and doing code reviews. So I'm trying to make it easier for the, uh, the community to get involved so they don't feel like either don't feel intimidated or they know the process or we have better dashboards telling them what needs attention. We made this uh, wiki page called gardening, which is just all the kind of gardening tasks that people can do if you have five minutes or 10 minutes to kill and you want to help go out. We try to kind of like say, here's a list of, you know, either GitHub queries for issues that, you know, might need attention, or here's some like the recent code reviews. Here's this like sorts of tasks you can do that might only take a few minutes, but it would move something along. So where is this list? Uh, there's a list at uh, golang.org slash wiki slash gardening. Huh. And so Various open source projects use this phrase gardening as kind of like kind of a, a background kind of cleanup task you can do because, you know, like gardening and picking weeds never ends. Right. And uh, there's a whole bunch of tasks listed there, you know, like maybe we had the label waiting for info on a bug and uh, reviewing the bugs on GitHub labeled for labeled waiting for info and seeing like, should this be closed? Did this, you know, time out or did the did the OP get back to us with something and say, like, oh, here's the information we requested and kind of just moving bugs along and pinging them when necessary. Or if someone sends in a, uh, a code review that has kind of like the wrong commit message format, you know, telling them how to format their commit message, telling them that they forgot tests, you know, finding typos. Just like there's lots of easy things you could do that is unrelated to whether the patch is actually correct or whatever. So here's an interesting thought. Usually for the release cycles, um, Dave Cheney puts together like like a presentation and multiple meetup groups kind of present that. Yeah, the global release parties. 
Yeah. So I wonder if like some sort of shared um, presentation like that could be put together and it could be used as content for meetups. A lot of meetups are always looking for content. So each person could present and maybe turn it into like, hey, we we don't have anything to talk about this month. Let's have like a gardening party, you know, where everybody kind of oh, that'd together, be fun. triages some stuff and they do it once every other month or something like that. And it becomes a collaborative effort and people can uh, kind of mentor each other people who have never done it before. Well, that's an interesting thought. Maybe I should try, try that out at the Seattle meetup sometime here. That reminds me too that uh, some, a, lot of the, a lot of languages have bug mesh. Bug mesh, yeah. Yeah, right? So, but we, ha- we don't have that yet. We, Brad, what do you think of uh, organizing something like that? I don't know what this is. So this is like uh, you take a couple days, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, Take a couple of days and you say, during these couple of days, we, well, first of all, the maintainers have to come up with a list of uh, issues to be taken care of. And we say, like, we just do a global effort and say, during these couple of days, we're going to come together and just, like, smash bugs. Oh, I see. So like a bug burn down or a fix it week or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Each, okay. each language, each community has a different name. And the, the emphasis, though, is to uh, create engagement in people who previously may not have had some. So uh, rather than spending the five minutes to fix the tiny bug yourself, you spend 20 minutes making it really easy for someone to get in and, and do it who hasn't committed patches before. Exactly. This is something that's actually been on my to-do list for the last, um, I don't know, I guess three months now. One of the things I was supposed to do last quarter was do a blog post saying like, you know, how to contribute to Go and how to get involved with those sorts of stuff. But I keep putting it off because I want more dashboards, you know, to like for people to use to make it even easier. But at some point, I just need to say enough is enough. And we, what we have is good enough for people to get involved. And yeah. And I think the the argument, too, is I think the bug mash or uh, there's another name for it. The Ruby had one. I, it, I don't feel like it was called bug mash. It was something along those lines. But that's a lot of times for people who want to contribute the code. And a lot of people, when they're just getting started out, aren't familiar with the code base and how things work. And they don't really have the confidence to contribute. Mm-hmm. So I think you won't get as many participants in those types of things as you will. And like, hey, you know, you may not want to jump in and contribute code, but you can contribute in these ways. And by doing so, that'll familiarize yourself with the project and the components and things like that. And then maybe build the confidence that way. Because one of the things I've seen in meetups too is a lot of people, it takes them a long time to get the confidence to submit a change list. Like they're always afraid that they're going to kind of get beat down. And sometimes you do, but people take it different ways. But I think helping, you know, with the gardening is a way to build that confidence where you're familiar with uh, the contributors to the project, you're familiar with who works on what and the right questions to ask. And kind of the the stages tickets go through because you're used to being involved in that process. We at least have the Slack channel now for um, for reviewers, uh, the Go reviews on on the Go for Slack. So people kind of hang out there that are triaging stuff and doing gardening. I didn't know this existed. I did not know that existed either. But I think any community effort to bring people together and and have a little bit of support to get over the hump of uh, getting set up and have the motive, having the motivation to get set up because they know there is going to be a list of is- issues that are easy enough for them to do the first time around is huge. For example, I had never contributed to Go at all, but yesterday I took a, a little bit of time to get set up, and it was like, oh, I have to, you know, I want to do, I want to add one line of text, but I have to get through this whole setup, which, by the way, was very simple. It just took a little bit of time, but it was very simple. I personally, I hate our contributing process and that document. It's so long and it scares so many people. And there's not really many steps, but there's so many words around it that people see it and they just run away screaming and say, why don't you use GitHub? And (laughs) the the answer is we, we probably should. I mean, like when we transitioned to GitHub, it was kind of a really quick forced migration because, uh, code.google.com was shutting down. So you know, GitHub was the obvious place and they had the bug tracker, but we weren't really ready to give up Garrett because code reviews on GitHub historically have been pretty terrible. Um, they've gotten better over time, but um, we really liked Garrett. So we said, OK, well, we'll use GitHub for the issue tracker. And, you know, 
the wiki and stuff like that. But for actually the code review, we'll do it in Garrett and GitHub will just be a mirror. But it's probably time that we wrote tooling to accept GitHub pull requests and at least for now convert them into Garrett uh, changes automatically. So the review would happen on Garrett. Garrett would still be the upstream. But if someone only knew the GitHub flow, they could stay within the GitHub flow and um, you know send new PRs like to revisions on the code review. And then we just transparently update the GitHub uh, or the Garrett CL. So probably we need to do that to start. Yeah. But yeah, because uh, like I was saying, it was not hard to do, but it took a little bit of time. And it was time that I broke down. Like I would read the paragraph and then do one thing and then go do something else. Like, ah, I don't want to go through this whole thing. <laughs> so like, I went back and forth and I finally, in a few hours, I completed all the steps. But it's something that I ha you have to do one time and it's very motivating if you're just going to go through that whole process. Like you're saying, the whole text to just do one thing that's small. But now that I went through it, I have, I pulled the code, I have the blog, I put down the blog, I put down the, you know, the website inside the, the Go project. It's, if I want to make a, like a documentation change, it's so simple. I just sync in its business as usual, I'll open a branch, I, I start a branch and in, I don't know the terminology, but I want to yeah. say like, the, using the Git terminology, like I just push. So it's very like now that I have it there, it's super, super simple. I just have to find, okay, what codes can I, what contributions can I make based on what, what's out there that you need? And, and that, that goes back to my point of having some like bug mesh events of it super cool. Yeah, well, now, now that you've spent the hour setting it up, now you need to fix a bunch of bugs to, you know, amortize that, that mm -hmm. time. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Got my time worth. The other thing that uh, people might not be familiar with if you're just looking for stuff is there's a help wanted tag in the GitHub for Go. Yeah, I was going through that right now. There is. Yeah. So. People always ask for us to use that more. They want more things. But I'm kind of against that label because we never seem to be able to use it correctly because there's never really a great definition of what it means. Because people want like easy or a beginner, beginner friendly label. But the problem is what is easy for one person is totally different for another user. And if something was truly trivial for everyone, it would have been fixed by now. So mm -hmm. we never really know. And help wanted is kind of a silly label, too, because we want help on every bug. So I've been using help wanted more and more lately, but I basically just add it to everything, which is fine. But I don't know. I feel, I feel like people should be feel free to jump in and grab anything. Yeah, there was a project that um, I contributed to, and I can't remember what it is. It might have been Ruby or something, but their label was bite-sized or something along those lines, which was kind of more like you could fit it in, in in one sitting, most people anyway, rather than like bigger implementations, like, you know, uh, generics. You might want help wanted because you want people's opinions on it, but that's certainly not something a new person is going to sit down and yeah. bang out in an hour just to, to get a contribution. We need a generic smash. I want to say something about the beginner label. Uh, I had an experience when I was first starting to learn Go. I went to a project, uh, one of these the big open source projects, and there were they had a label for like for beginners or easy or something. And I was going through the issues. I'm like, holy smokes, this is hard. <laughs> this is if this is beginner, you know, like wow, what is uh, intermediate? It's like rocket science kind of stuff. So it really scared me away. But I'm sort of like, I've been working with programming for a while. So like, I gave it a chance after I learned, okay, I can understand this stuff now. But like Brad was saying, if you label something that sounds like a beginner level for you, but could be very complex for somebody else coming in, you can really get people freaked out. <laughs> so gotta be careful with those labels. But I like the idea of, of labeling like based on bite size or time chunks. That's good. Yeah, well, a lot of times you don't know until you get in there how, how gnarly it's going to be. True. That's another thing. So I think we are a little over time for our first sponsor break. So let's go ahead and take that. Our first sponsor for today is TopCal. 
Hey everyone, Adam Stukoviak here, Editor-in-Chief of Changelog. Our friends at TopTal have been sponsoring our podcast for years, and now they're sponsoring GoTime as well. We think they're one of the best ways to hire developers and designers, as well as one of the best ways to freelance as a software developer or designer. Head to toptal.com slash go to learn more. Tell them you heard about them on GoTime. If you'd like a more personal introduction, email me, adam at changelog.com. And now back to the show. All right, so we are back talking to Brad Fitzpatrick. So we were talking about um, Go and contributing before the break. But one thing I want to lead into is you've always got these like cool hobby projects going on. <laughs> uh, what's something cool you're working on right now? Um, I mean, I'm always kind of working on... Um, I, I moved to Seattle recently, so I've been working on lots of miscellaneous home automation stuff. You know, uh, we got a bunch of Z-Wave light switches and I, I got some cheapo security cameras and I've been working on doing my own like motion detection. So I guess actually it was last GopherCon, I gave a lightning talk about my uh, my motion detection security system. So that's something like whenever I have a few minutes, I try to improve that a little bit. But Now, are you doing that in Go or are you just using like OpenCV? No, I'm actually, uh, it's almost all Go. I have a little Go server in the house that connects to the cameras and gets their uh, their compressed MPEG stream of the video. And then I stream it outside of the house to a, a cloud instance that has more compute power. And then I have a little FFmpeg child process that decodes the video. And it also does the edge detection, which is built into FFmpeg. But then I just output the raw pixels over standard out from FFmpeg. And I, I read the raw pixels out of FFmpeg with the edge detection. And I compute the delta over time of where the edges move. And once it crosses thir- certain thresholds and certain zones of the video, then it uh, starts recording. Or it, it's always recording like the last five or six seconds, even when there's nothing in a little rolling ring buffer. But once there's motion, then I start uh, streaming it to an object on cloud storage. And then I have little processes in the background that go and generate GIFs from them, little two-second GIFs, selecting the right frames to make like the most interesting you know GIF possible. <laughs> and uh, then I could like you know send those on Telegram or whatever. So it's kind of fun. You have all the video streaming out of your the raw video streaming out of your house to the cloud. Your your ISP must love you. Oh, I, I have I have gigabit. It's cool. That's awesome, though. See, so speaking speaking of projects that are. Uh, over people's heads. I don't know whether I could I could build something like that that does all the edge detection and things like that. That's awesome. Now you need like random captions for the for the gifs too. You know. Yeah, like I, was, just, I was thinking of like throwing it through a uh, the Google Vision API or something and identifying objects. Like I found some cats that were playing on my front porch the other day because they set off the motion detection. There was like a black cat and a gray cat that were uh, chasing each other. Oh no, that would be cool. So you could get a text message that said there are cats in your backyard. Yeah. Cat alert. I like that. Uh, so um, the other thing, too, is it, like you always have the skyline pictures. Are you doing something with that or is that just kind of like on a set interval and you're just storing them? When I first moved in, uh, I wanted to do something with it. There were all these cranes in Seattle and I learned to have like a time lapse of all these new skyscrapers going up. So I, I put a camera on the roof and I have a picture every minute that you know, uploaded to a cloud storage. And so I'm up to like, I don't know, something like 780,000 of these eight megapixel JPEGs. And so I want to do something with them. Um, I've been trying to think of fun ideas, little web app to build to let you, you know, drag your mouse around or something and have the sun follow your mouse or like track planes or boats or huh. let you sort by hue so you can see the sky in different colors. But I don't know. I haven't, I haven't spent time with that. I have the data, which was the... Uh, the tedious part. And now that I have it, I need to do something fun with it. You know, it's really good that you work for a cloud provider because <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any anybody would want to have the bills that you probably have for. Oh, no, I mean, <laughs> that's not too much at all. It's I think it's only uh, 150 gigabytes or something now. That's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad at all. That's half of my iTunes library. <laughs> <laughs> you still collect music? <laughs> I did for a long time. Now I, I don't even use iTunes anymore. I just sold my car and I found uh, my old iPod, like one of those big ones that had a rotating hard drive in it. And nice. it was still it was still in my glove compartment hooked up to the car because the car had this iPod, you know, connector cable in there. Uh-huh. And I had my 
basically my college music snapshot on this like you know 80 gig disc and it hadn't been updated since then but it was still working so that's so awesome i found a a, a sony mini disc in my drawer yesterday or the day before and i have absolutely no way to know what music is on it i'm sure it's really epic but i have absolutely no clue i'm sure you could probably craigslist the drive or something for it yeah. somebody's bound if, to if have I, one if i cared i've got a probably a portable hard drive or two with music on it that i held on to for the longest time because i'm like well, well what if i actually need the mp3s and your, your napster collection I and mean, now uh it's just it's too easy you can stream from any device and bluetooth in my car and spotify from there problem solved i don't, I don't need mp3s i found a box of my earliest programs from the apple II on these like five and a quarter inch floppies nice. and i had no way to read them but uh somebody on the internet said oh i have i have the hardware for that i can i can image them and send you back the raw data then i figured i could you know put it in an emulator or something and so i sent them off and never heard from the guy again and i tried to ping <laughs> him every six months and say hey do you still have the discs can you send them back nothing so uh oh but it's okay they're probably dead anyway and or or have you had your identity stolen recently <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he found something good on there he's like ah oh. no those programs were not they were not good <laughs> uh i still miss some of those days too like i always ask people when they say they have the five and a half so it's like do you have Oregon trail i bet you you could no. get that in an emulator now you guys are so young when I was a kid, we had to type in our applications from the back of Byte magazine. And when you turned off the computer, the app went with it. <laughs> you had to type it in every time you wanted to de- use it. That's right. We didn't have, I didn't even have a cassette deck to store when I first started computing. Yeah, that, that's definitely before my time. And it was, you know, mom would come in and she'd be, you need to shut that off. Like, no, 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 no. We're not shutting anything off. <laughs> no, no, no. That was a lot of typing. I do remember having like 28K baud modems. Actually, might have had a 9600 at one point, but or like if you wanted music, you wanted the whole CD, you had to leave it on overnight and hope that nobody <laughs> like disconnected the phone line. And you woke up in the morning. No. <laughs> oh, it's funny, though, because generations now probably don't even realize the irony, right? Like when, we, when a lot of us started out with the Internet, you, you called up the Internet, right? The, you, the internet was served over telephone lines, and now yeah. telephone is served over internet lines. True. Have you guys watched the uh, the TV show Halt and Catch Fire? No. Uh, only a couple of episodes. Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, it's you know, follows the kind of late 70s and 80s uh, computer industry. And one of the, uh, I think season two is about um, a dial-up ISP, kind of like a BBS system company that they're building. And the whole thing is super nostalgic. It's, it's a pretty good show. That is a good show. I also didn't watch all the episodes, but I need to go back to it. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah, what was the, the HBO one that was about startup life? Silicon Valley. Yeah, there was that one and there was another one. Yeah, I think Silicon Valley was the one. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Yeah, I can't <laughs> watch it. It's just, it's too close to home. It's like, yeah, w- w- one guy took the money and then I think he killed himself. And it's like, no, wait, maybe he didn't take the money. Oh, I forget. <laughs> it's just they, they did. I think they did it really well. They did a good job consulting with whoever they consulted with. Probably Brad. It was Brad behind the scenes. Yep. Probably. So we were talking about um, storage. And of course, we need to talk about, I don't know how to s- pronounce it. Camly Camly store? Store? Camly store. Yeah, Camly the, uh, store. The, the temporary name that was not temporary. I always mm-hmm. thought it yeah. was going to rename it one day. I watched a little bit of your video and I understand that it's uh, an acronym. Yeah, so this was this was the project that got me into Go, actually. I was I was working on Android at the time at Google and Mountain View and the, the bus ride between San Francisco and uh, Mountain View. On a good day, it takes you know forty five minutes. On a bad day, it takes like two hours. And so I had I had sometimes four hours to kill on this bus, and I could either hate my life or I could write code. And but I needed something to write, and so I, I had this idea of I wanted to build this kind of I don't know this storage system to end all storage systems to back up all my stuff and archive all my all my content from all these you know social networking sites. You know I've tweets places and photos places and blog posts other places. I wanted to have like a you know, all of my stuff, all my backups and files and content and all my websites hosted out of this thing. 
So I kind of I knew the data model I wanted. I knew like kind of the protocols I wanted. I had kept a bunch of notes. So then I had to actually just build the thing and I had to choose what language I wanted to use. And at Google, kind of the options are C++, Python, or Java. And I had written enough in all these languages to know I definitely did not want to write in any of these languages. Um, C++ is basically only usable if you have a giant standard library like Google and you have a good build system like Google. But otherwise, the tooling for C++ is uh, kind of painful. And I'd written enough like Python and Perl to know that it's not really great to write servers in because you have to either do lots of callbacks and all this sort of stuff, or you have really terrible performance. And I was writing Java for Android at the time, and I just I had enough Java in me that I was just kind of done with it. So this was about the time that Go was coming out. And so I, I decided I would prototype my idea in Go first. And so I got into that, writing it on the bus, which was great because it, you know, I didn't need the internet, had good kind of good tooling or good enough tooling at the time. This was before the Go command, so you had to use make files, but it still compiled so quickly that it wasn't too bad. And I kept finding problems of, you know, things that were missing in the standard library and things that the HTTP package didn't get right. And so I just started sending changes off to uh, to the Go team, which I guess at the time was, you know, Russ and Ian and Rob and Robert. And Russ kept approving my HTTP stuff, and I kept sending more. And eventually mm-hmm. I just uh, switched to the Go team full time. I got an email from Rob one day, and he was like, hey, do you want to do this full time? I had already done Android a few years at that point, and it was pretty obvious that Android was here to stay. It wasn't a crazy idea anymore, so it was time for a new crazy idea. Mm-hmm. But now it looks like Go might be here to stay too. Now it's time for you to move on. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what I would do. Yeah, I remember very specifically in probably mid 2010, there was a, a good solid time period where every change in Go was driven by a Camly store change. Yeah, it was, I mean, like it was, um, it was easy to follow it like clockwork. All the HTTP stuff kind of came out of there. Uh, the database stuff came out of there. A lot of um, changes in the strings package, even like strings contains and the very basic things like that. So I took a look at Camly Store from watching your videos, and it's really cool. And we actually have a, a question. Uh, we have a few questions from uh, listener Zellen Hunter. And his question about Camly Store in specific is uh, Will you go back to? actively developing Camly Store. And I saw that you did have a release this month, but does it mean you're actively back to working on it? Uh, no, there's this guy. I I actively review stuff that this uh, other guy, Mathieu, uh, works on. And he works on it all the time. So I'm, I'm still kind of watching and involved. I don't write as much code on it as I used to. Maybe when I go on my paternity leave, I will do that instead of uh, in my breaks. We'll see. Do you see it ever becoming a solid product? Uh, I mean, it's it's pretty usable and solid right now. It's every release we do gets a little bit more uh, a little bit more mainstream and a little bit more usable. So we focused. I think it was two or three releases ago. We did this launcher. So if you go to like camelystore.org/launch, we have a little form that creates you your own instance running on a on GCE on Google Cloud. Well, that's cool. Huh. That's cool. And then, so then it came up, but it was like at an ugly IP address and the security was over an HTTPS cert that was self-signed. And then I went off and um, I worked on like Let's Encrypt support and I added that to the uh, the Golang. Uh, I worked with this other guy who implemented Acme, but then I made this auto cert package that's a Golang X crypto Acme auto cert. And so we added that to, uh, to Camly Store as well. So now Camly Store can get a Let's Encrypt certificate, but we didn't have we needed to do a domain name automatically. So when people created their own instance, they had one. So then we created this uh, DNS server that you get a subdomain of camelystore.net automatically. And we have a little protocol that's like Acme. And we'll give you any subdomain that you can prove that you have the key pair for. So you get like kind of an ugly domain name, you know, which is your like a fingerprint of your key dot camelystore.net. And we automatically do the DNS kind of like a Dyn DNS server. And then you request a Let's Encrypt cert for that. So the end result is you go through this wizard and you say create VM. And then like, you know, 60 seconds later or 40 seconds later, you have a running instance with a fully trusted cert and domain name. Now, how do you come across the or how do you get around the uh, subdomain rate limiting for Let's Encrypt? Because they have a pretty 
pretty strict, like 20 subdomains per week limit. Uh, we don't have that many users, so we haven't really oh. hit that problem yet. Okay, well, be warned. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. Challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and at that point, we'll tell people to like bring their own or like send them through some domain creation flow elsewhere. Another question from this user is, how is the core Go team doing with burnout? So I'm not even aware that the Go team has a burnout issue, but I thought it was a good question to ask in case this is the case. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, it is getting a little bit repetitive. I know like Andrew, he he went to work on uh, Upspin because he kind of needed a change. You know, you do the same thing for years and years and it kind of gets a little repetitive. I'm kind of there myself because I think Go 1.9 will be like my 10th or 11th Go release, not counting all the, the point releases in the middle. And you can't, it's a little frustrating that you can't, fix a lot of things and you keep seeing the same bug reports and the same proposals over and over and you have to keep duping all these bugs and say, sorry, you know, we can't change this or this would have to wait for some sort of go-to. So I, I try to mix it up and do different tasks occasionally and focus on different things. Like the HTTP2 stuff I did for Go 1.6 was a good distraction because I got to actually, you know, write code and think about new types of problems. And now I'm doing all these kind of dashboards and stats on community interaction and stuff, which is interesting in some ways. And I've been focusing on uh, kubernetes defying all of our build infrastructure and kind of all of the microservices that run uh, the Go build system. And that's kind of been fun to learn about Kubernetes. But yeah, I definitely go through periods where things are very repetitive and boring, and then I have to like find something new to do for a while. Do you think that the kind of frustration with not being able to change and things like that might help motivate more of a 2.0? at least getting the, the thought process and talks going on about what two might look like? Yeah, I think, I think we're all kind of feeling that or getting in that, you know, feeling that we probably need to do one. I don't know. It's been like, it's been almost, I think it's Go 1 or Go came out, not Go 1, but Go became an open source project in like November of 2009. And so I think Rob was saying that if you were to do a Go 2, you know, a ten, 10 years would probably be a good time. I mean, my personally, my biggest concern is that another language would come out and would have, you know, Go routines. But I feel like Go routines are Go's real feature. No one else does lightweight threading really well. I mean, other people have copied the good tooling, but the Go type system isn't incredibly interesting. If, if someone came out with like a t language with very good tooling, that was still like kind of simple and had Go routines and made like writing servers very easily, but it also had like a, a more powerful type system. Have you guys seen Crystal yet? Which one is that? Yeah, Crystal's the uh, Ruby alike that's written in in C or C plus plus, and it's fast as hell. Compiles down to native. It has their cons. In fact, they've stolen all of Go routines and channels, the whole works, and it's it is actually really fast. Standard libraries still need some work. It's not 1.0 yet. But I was playing with it a weekend or two weekends ago, and it does feel like Ruby, and it is fast as grease lightning. So mm. it'll be interesting to see. I always like tinkering with new languages. Oh, who's it? Who's behind it? I don't remember. A small group in Europe, maybe. Yeah, it's crystal hyphen lang. Crystal lang dot org. Yeah, it's a uh, hyphen between the crystal and lang now. It's sponsored by. I can't remember. Manas, M-A-N-A-S. Manas.tech is the company behind it. No, that's promising that there's, you know, more than one person. It's always fun just to even poke at other languages. Um, what, what are some of the other ones that we've poked at over the years, Brian? Pony, yeah, Nim. Pony's, Pony is not for me. Nim's fun. Yeah. Um, what are the others? Um, I played with Elixir. It's, Elixir's not different enough for me. You, I mean, you're right there. Like, Go routines are, are really awesome. Like, I remember the first time, like, I discovered that like, you can just kind of use them at will. You know, like, and when you recommend that to people, they're like, well, how many of these can I have? As many as you need. Wait, there's not, like, some kind of cap? No, just keep, how many do you keep want? using Go routines. I was, I was following both uh, Rust and Swift. Both of them were flirting with the idea of adding lightweight tasks or Go routines or fibers or whatever you want to call them. And both projects kind of, gave up on it and said, well, well, it's a little difficult. And I think pthreads are good enough. And maybe we'll think about this later. And so 
every, everyone kind of keeps thinking about it and not doing it. So some somebody else will do it, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, I think it's a guarantee somebody will do it. It just becomes a question of, of who is it a new language or does it get adopted into a new version of a current language? Um, but I think it's hard not to at least consider it with kind of the accelerated growth that goes seen over just a couple of years. Uh, I think that other languages or people, prospective new languages, at least have to question, like, why are people so drawn to that language and start to adopt some of those things? Well, going back to Crystal for a minute, you know, Crystal has the recipe for some good success because people enjoy uh, the Ruby syntax a lot. Some people do. And adding things like Go routines and channels to that seems like it could be a good recipe. But when you play with it, 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 it just doesn't all click like Go does. You know, go fluid. Yeah. Yeah. Go, go. I've heard many times, you know, one of the core competencies of Go is that it's, it's written to be read. And most languages just aren't. Go is optimized for people to read that code. And it has such a huge impact on your productivity. It's, it's hard to describe uh, how hard it would be to replicate that somewhere else. I think from the other side, two people don't want to try the language because they, they, they want something they feel is complex. You know, it kind of tickles that part of their brain that, now, ah, oh, you know, I, I need to learn something super cool and complex rather than kind of like uh, what they feel is like an easier language. So it's hard to break that barrier to be like, no, it doesn't matter your skill level. You're still going to love it. I promise. Hmm. Did you guys see um, YouTube did is working on that uh, Python runtime written in Go? The gr- I think Grumpy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That'll be interesting to uh, to see how far they get. It'll be also interesting to see if other people, other languages use go as their runtime yeah last week we actually just discussed a project we saw um where somebody was implementing um the ruby runtime in go i don't know how far along it was but we we did see it weren't there two of them two different ruby runtimes in go one of them was like a a ruby like language implemented um in go the other one was yeah supposed to meet the, the actual ruby spec now talking about uh we're talking about languages now, but I'm dying to ask, and other people are asking as well, is there any prospect, and how good of a prospect is there, if the answer is yes, for Go to have genetics? I'm, I'm asking this because obviously a lot of people want to know, uh, people ask all the time, and uh, my understanding is that there has never been a no to this question. So I, I think the door has always been open to that possibility. Uh, yeah, I think I think everybody basically wants it. There's there's not very much anti-generic sentiment on the team. I think we would all like it if we could put algorithms in the standard library and you know more containers and data structures in the standard library or somewhere in some shared library, even if it's not built in the standard library. But it's just there hasn't been a great proposal. I mean, Ian Ian Lance Taylor has written I think five or six proposals at this point. And every time he generally rejects his own proposals, he's even implemented a few of them. So he's probably the one that will figure it out. I don't know if it'll be his seventh or eighth proposal he writes, but um, <laughs> I think I think he's he's getting closer. He seems to like each one of his proposals a little bit more. And this is Ian who? Uh, Ian Lance Taylor, ENT on at Golang or whatever. Okay. I think he's Ian Lance Taylor on GitHub. He's mostly responsible for the GCC port of Go. Yeah. Yeah, and he wrote like the gold linker. So he he knows everything about, I don't know, signals and linkers and all this kind of hairy stuff that um, I don't know. (laughs) The magic stuff that I want to ignore. Yeah. Whenever I have some really bizarre Unix question, you know, like, here's a process control group with a tty session leader and something gets a signal and something dies and blah 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 he's like well of course you know and unix this page of the specification and does that except from that version of unix blah 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 but he he knows how unix works and how low level things work so and he also thinks a lot about languages so i think the summary is i imagine if there's a go-to it would have generics and like I don't think we would do a go-to without generics. It just wouldn't be interesting enough. I mean, it would be too big of a change to do a go-to and break things without uh, it being worth it. And I imagine there probably will be a go-to at some point. Um, I just don't know about timing. 
Yeah, and I don't think you want to tell everybody generics and go three when they see how long it takes to get to go two. They'll, they'll know like it's never going to happen. I also think if there's a, a go two, we can't pull a, a Python three or a Perl six and kind of uh, nuke the world and expect things to be okay. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think any. I mean, I haven't really thought about the details, but I think if in go to any time you import something, you're allowed to import down, like you're allowed to import and use a go one package. But, you know, go one packages can't import go to packages because, you know, semantics would be different. But I, I think somehow we have to make the uh, ecosystems coexist to some degree. That's interesting. So I think we passed up our, our second sponsor break. So let's go ahead and take that. Our second sponsor for today is Datadog. Hey Gophers, your applications sit on layers of dynamic infrastructure and supporting services. And our friends at Datadog bring you visibility into every part of your infrastructure, plus APM that integrates deeply with Go libraries for monitoring your application's performance with support for Gin, Gorilla Mux, and gRPC, and more on the way. You can get fine-grained performance metrics from your Golang apps with minimal instrumentation. Datadog integrates seamlessly with all of your apps and systems from Slack to Amazon Web Services, so you can get visibility in minutes. Head to gotime.fm slash datadog to get started, get a free t-shirt with full observability, distributed tracing, and customizable visualizations. Datadog is loved and trusted by thousands of enterprises, including Salesforce, PagerDuty, and Zendesk. If you haven't tried them yet at your company or on your side project, Go to gotime.fm slash datadog to get started, get a free t-shirt, check them out. Our deepest thanks to them for being a sponsor of the show. All right, so we are back talking to Brad Fitzpatrick. So we were just talking about kind of like uh, vision for go to. Did anybody want to jump into like any interesting projects and news they may have seen this past week? I got a good one that I saw. I have a good one too. So. Go ahead. You go first. Actually, I've got uh, three good ones. You got three good ones. I got three good ones. So you Are go you first. hogging all the good ones? No. Nope. So, and I, I hope I don't I don't butcher his name, but uh, I saw a project called uh, Perif IO, which is P E R I P H dot I O, um, by Mark Antoine Ruel, I think it's pronounced. Um, but it's uh, like an alternative to GoBot. It doesn't need any kind of supporting libraries or CGO and things like that. And I was chatting with him a little bit about it. And I guess it can do bit banging at like in the megahertz range. Um, so we actually have him scheduled to be on the show in like two weeks. So we'll get into more detail. But uh, really awesome for doing like GPIO and I squared C and SPI. And it's, it, he's got one wire implemented into it too. So if you're messing around with like Eagle Bones or Raspberry Pis and doing GPIO stuff, uh, really interesting project to check out. Sweet, making barbecues. <laughs> I I know, like um, it stinks because I I decided like for the meat probes and stuff like all right, I'm just gonna use just a straight ARM processor, just do embedded, you know, C. And then I saw that and I'm like, ah, oh, I kind of want to use a single board computer again now. It's okay to change. It is. It is absolutely okay. So I have a cool project and a shout out that I want to make. Um, uh, uh, one of our readers or listeners, I guess, but not readers, was um, listening to Go Time while hiking across the Alps and sent us an email last week about his uh, code generation tool because he knows how much I like some code generation. So uh, this code generation tool is at github.com slash Dave slash Jennifer. And unfortunately, radio is not good for pictures. However, uh, we'll try to find a way to post the picture of Dave standing on top of some giant uh, Swiss Alp mountain flashing us the peace sign because he was listening to Go Time. So shout out to you, Dave. That's awesome. I think Go Time is probably the perfect thing to do to get you through the, the humdrum of hiking through those boring Alps. Does Dave have a last name? I don't know Dave's last name. If I, I would have to dig up my email to find out Dave's last name. What does it is go time announcement sound like after you've climbed a mountain? <laughs> heaven. <laughs> it sounds like heaven. So that was one. And then the other awesome announcement is from uh, github.com slash my, M-Y-I-T-C-V. 
my IT CV, and that is React bindings for Gopher.js, now offers Preact support, which is awesome because Preact is so much smaller than React. So I am really looking forward to getting some downtime and playing with Gopher.js React bindings. These are specifically cool. These are from Paul Jolly, by the way, because they uh, they do code generation for all the yucky stuff. So you just implement a couple interfaces and then type code generate, and it generates all of the Go code, which then gets transpiled into Gopher.js code, which talks to React or Preact. Now, Brad, you're doing a bunch of uh, Gopher.js stuff too, right? Uh, I'm not so much. Um, uh, Mathieu, who works on Camly Store, has added. It's starting to transition more of our stuff to uh, to go for JS and to use uh, React. And I kind of look at it and it makes kind of some sense, but I haven't used much of it myself. I think React is what made me love doing web apps in Go. Hmm. Before that, I, it was like a Rails thing. Like, uh, but doing the front end's hard, but React is just too easy to build a UI on top of a Go API. So Dave's last name is Brophy with a B. Oh, thank you. Dave Brophy, you're absolutely right. Don't thank me, thank Florin Patton. Oh, good job, Florin. That's why we have a, a pool of listeners in the Gopher Slack to help us out. Yeah, why are we the hosts? They seem to know more than we I know. do. Kind of funny, <laughs> they totally <isn't> do. <laughs> <laughs> we just wing it. They do the work, we wing it. <laughs> oh, actually, look, uh, is this you, Brian, who dropped in? Uh, is GoTo actually happening? No, that was not me. It was me. That's interesting. Is that on Reddit? Yeah. So Reddit has a huge thread about well, the the title is is go to actually happening? If so, when will it happen? <laughs> it's very oh, long. So interestingly, we just talked about that and what yeah. it might need to include and uh, roughly the timeline. You were kind of saying the ten year mark probably seems right, but it sounds like you know discussions would be had about what it needs to look like and, and proposals and stuff like that would happen in the meantime. I have a fun thought exercise for you guys. If, if you did a go-to and we remove stuff from the standard library, what would you remove or how much could you remove? Hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, yeah, I'd probably, I feel like there's probably a good amount that could be removed, probably like 30% or so. Like if based on the things I've written and how little I use components, but that's, it's also hard because how many people use the components that I don't use? Do you need a, a bad SMTP client implementation? Nope. Nope. Do you need uh, X509? Nope. We don't need archive. We don't need compress. We don't need container. I've been using X509. Actually. They don't need to be in standard library, though. They can still live somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, uh, my... My threshold for standard library inclusion is probably more like we could get rid of 80% of what's in here, not not 30. So here's the even crazier question. Could you get rid of HTTP? Yes, absolutely. So this, this is where people kind of uh, differ. A lot of people say that like having built-in HTTP is interesting, but I think it's kind of a maintenance pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's where the... The dilemma comes in, right? Because being in the standard library has its advantage because, for example, like I remember starting out doing Go, it was ridiculously easy to do HTTP stuff because I didn't have to find a library for it or write one or which one of the 15 is the canonical one that people use. But it also, any the more that's in the standard library, the more that has to meet the Go 1 guarantee, right? It's, it's not able to be changed. So moving it out allows uh, things to move at a quicker pace. Yeah, the most interesting thing about having things in the standard library is you you center the whole ecosystem around certain types. Like everyone uses time.time .time and time.duration or context now, you know, rather than saying, oh, which context package to use or which time package to use. I mean, this is why we even added database SQL originally to the to the standard library, because we were watching and there were like four or five databases that all had totally different interfaces on GitHub, you know, for MySQL versus um, uh, SQLite versus some, you know, Postgres. And so we added it to Go1 just to kind of unify the ecosystem kind of to feel the right way or to not the right way, but to feel the same way. But 
I don't know. So what's the minimum standard library you could have? I think in answering that question, you also have to think about usability. And even um, this listener, Chris Benson, just mentioned uh, about marketing, how HTTP in the standard library is good marketing for Go. And I was thinking, before even reading that, I was thinking exactly that. One of the biggest hallmarks for Go is, look, it's a, such a good server-side language. It even has TTP right in the standard library. It's so easy to boot up a server with Go. So even though it might be a pain to maintain, you have to weigh that out with, okay, it's uh, how much does it do for attracting people and for usability? Yeah, I think uh, you have the usability side of things, but I think that there can be people agree on things like even say like the Ruby world. There's a lot of common packages people use and those are just the things the community uses. They're kind of the agreed upon thing and they're not part of the standard library. I think uh, having some of these like canonical types, like you said, time and context and things that are probably going to be shared. Those types of things I think are needed, not necessarily what you do with them. Like say, for instance, HTTP, anything that abstracts the network stack, syscalls on the operating system and and Matt uh, layer and uh, the GoTime FM channel mentioned all of these too. Like those things, I think are are needed, especially for adoption. Because a lot of people, and and you brought up the point too, Brad, is like a lot of people aren't familiar with uh, the the Linux internals and how some of these things signals are handled and syscalls and capabilities and things like that. So abstracting those away definitely helps adoption. Well, one of the things we have to keep in mind is when uh, way way back in my earliest Java days. You had to pick the uh, Java framework that you were going to use. You know, basically, you had to pick your standard library. Was it Apache Commons? Was it Java X? And if if we take too much out of Go's standard library, we're going to fragment the community by forcing groups of those other packages that work well together. And that might be strange. I think there's a lot of interesting tools coming out now, though, to find packages and tooling, right? So um, a good example, and we talk about it all the time, is uh, oh, it's escaping me. The plugin we use in, in Chrome. Sourcegraph? Sourcegraph, yeah. So like that's a really interesting thing, too, like to, to find packages and see how they're used and see how many other people are using them. So is the problem really that they have to be in the standard library, or is it that we just need better ways of finding these things? But I think the difficulty comes in maintenance, though, too, right? If it's in the standard library, this is kind of playing devil's advocate back the other way. If it's in the standard library, we can guarantee maintenance. Like, like I remember several MySQL drivers that I used in the early days that just got abandoned. And you're like, okay, so uh, <laughs> which one's popular now? And let's migrate. Um, I think maybe finding the issue of finding might not be the biggest issue. You might be able to find things, but then you have to decide which one to use and how do you, what criteria do you even use to judge? And um, I don't know, just going back to the HTTP case, I'm picking on it, but I can't count how many times people ask, I've, I've seen people asking, what framework should I use? And people just, the veterans would say, just use the standard library. It's there, it's simple, even though you have to do a little bit more work to get values or, or params, just use what's in the standard library. And people will go, yeah, okay. So here's the question, e Brad. I'm sorry, even though there are so many frameworks for HTTP. Okay, I'm done with that. <laughs> so, so what is the Go team's stance on the promotion of other uh, libraries outside of the standard library? Like, for instance, like as a thought experiment, if these things did not exist, people would probably look to the Go team to point them towards the things they should be using. So what's, what's the Go team's stance on things like that? If there was another HTTP library uh, that was somehow better, would the Go team direct people towards that? Or do you try to stay out of other people's projects, promotion of them? Yeah, I mean, we, we don't have a policy for or against it. Um, mostly, we stay out of it because we don't really have the time to do kind of unsolicited code reviews around the community. I know there, like we used to promote, and we still promote, um, the Meek G DNS library whenever someone has some kind of esoteric dns needs we say here is your esoteric dns package that does everything <laughs> so uh yeah we, we definitely refer people when there's an answer um yeah so i think as long as there's guidance from you know the the veterans 
towards things that they should be used. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much. I kind of want to go through one night and just look through it and and check off ones I don't think would be useful. It'd be cool to do like a survey to the community and see kind of what everybody agrees on. I don't know if you need a, a survey. You have you have the whole corpus of GitHub code, right? You can look at imports and see. Like we have the data in godoc.org. I just don't think we're using it well enough. Oh, that's true too. Yeah. I think we should just put all the packages on an island and let them fight to see who gets to stay. <laughs> Break a broomstick. If you don't have the skills, yeah, if you don't have the skills, you're not staying. It would be interesting to see how much of different packages are just not used at all or used very, very little. But that's I, that's hard to judge, too. Like, when you think about trying to do the machine learning on that, like, how do you train it? Maybe some things like HTTP are just inherently used more based on the type of software we write. I was horrified recently to find that a lot of people are using this uh, package I wrote for, I wrote a memcache client, and it was one of the first things I wrote in Go. It was kind of a exercise in, in writing a package. And I don't think I even ever used it myself. But, you know, I, I wrote a bunch of tests, and I started a, a real memcache server as a child process and the tests. And, but it doesn't perform well. It, it doesn't pipeline requests on the connection. So if you have lots of activity going on, you'll get all these new TCP connections to your memcache servers and stuff. And this bit some uh, Google Cloud customer recently. Then, and then some other Google engineers started debugging this library and filing bugs against me that this code that I basically never used was inefficient. And I was like, well, crap, now we have to go maintain this thing. So <laughs> delete it. Yeah, well, but then, you know, our package management tools are kind of non-existent or suck. And so then I would break lots of people and then I'd, cause even more problems so left pad (laughs) so so playing along the lines of the thought experiment rather than the standard library what part of the language itself the syntax would you do away with if you could start over and go to (laughs) i recently proposed that we uh we drop complex numbers interesting i mean they're they're in there because uh i guess ken really liked them but if you survey all the code that exists anywhere inside Google, on GitHub, et cetera, like nobody uses them. Like people, people for fun implement like the Mandelbrot set or something. But other than that, they don't have very many valid uses. Yeah, I mean, but on the other hand, everyone or lots of things, not everyone, but lots of things relatively use big ints. And those are kind of a pain to use because, you, you know, you can't use plus and minus and like the built in operators. You have to like call all these methods. So we're kind of in this weird position where complex numbers are first class and go, but nobody uses them. But big integers, you know, used in crypto and stuff are not easy to use. There's another proposal from uh, from Rob to make big ints just be automatic. So the int type, rather than being 32 bits on 32 bit machines and 64 bit on 64 bit machines, it's just an int means a big int and you implement it as efficiently as possible. So and you have the compiler prove things so if the compiler can prove it's never like bigger than 64 bit then it's actually a 64 bit int but if it's unprovable then you know it's a big int behind the scenes i think my first thing that i would get rid of is new new versus make well i mean most people don't use it so it usually only confuses newcomers right like most of us just declare a literal and get the pointer to it and you find that a lot of people coming into the language it looks like there's multiple ways of declaring stuff, right? You can do var name equals, you know, whatever the value is at the ampersand. Or you can do the quick short declaration operator, or you can do new. And I think it, there's too many ways. So it's hard, like, because we, we always want consistency in the code, right? So that's probably something I see um, from newcomers all the time where, where it'll get mixed and there's kind of confusion what they use when. and. Although I, I do find it kind of ugly when you see like an empty struct literal being declared, you know, and getting a pointer to it. You're like there's, you're not, you're not initializing it with anything. Like why are you using the literal? How about you, Brian? Is there anything you'd get rid of? You'd ax first thing. Make. <laughs> <laughs> so then, what would your proposal be to declare things like slices and arrays and? We, we already have Absolutely. lots of ways to declare memory. I don't think make adds anything to the, to the bundle. 
and it just adds confusion. This coming from someone who teaches Go. Why do we have to make slices and why do we have to make maps when we declare everything else with var? But the, the interesting thing here, though, is that you can, you can also declare capacity, right? And in some cases, yes. that, that matters. Right? I'm not arguing whether it's useful. I'm just arguing that I would change it somehow. I, I don't have any solutions. Well, if Go2 if Go had generics, you could imagine um, slices and maps being a type in a package in the standard library. And you could say, like, you know, bytes.new or slice.new or maps.new or something like that. Oh, uh, yeah, that's true, too. See? Yeah. How about you, Carlicia? What would you ask? I can't think of anything, but I really like your idea, Eric, to get rid of new. And it's just I vote for that. rethinking kind of the way things are declared. There's just just a lot of ways. So you run across many of them. And you know, a lot of a lot of people who have been around the language kind of have like their standard way of doing things in different use cases. But I have one. Um the naked return, is that what it's called? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. You need to get rid of that. That's good. I I used to use that all the time when I first started programming Go, and now I never <laughs> use it. Yeah, it's a little unfortunate that like Naked returns and named result parameters are coupled. Yeah, but naked return could probably go. Or also, like, returning that you can't... Re- like, let's say you have a function that returns a time dot time and an error, and you just want to, like, omit. You only want to return the error, and you just want the zero value of everything else. Right now, you have to say, return time dot time braces comma error. And so there's various proposals to, like, let you use an underscore or something there to also mean the zero value of any type or you can also imagine something like return just the error and omit all the other arguments oh yeah that'd be interesting yeah because yeah, I, I don't like that that's one of the things i'm talking about kind of with the declaration is I, I don't really care for the empty struct literal like the time dot time braces like it, it adds no context because you're not you're not actually initializing with anything so that would be we would be really cool to be able to use just the zero value in kind of a quicker short form way I don't know what that would look like because I'm not a language designer, but that would be useful. There's also some weird things in Go, like ranging over a string uh, gives you the Unicode, the UTF-8 code points rather than the bytes of the string. And it's the only thing in the language really that ever assumes that strings are UTF-8. So it's kind of it's kind of this weird wart. And there's lots of those little kind of weird warts. Yeah, that's interesting. And I guess that that would become a problem, too, because some of the libraries assume the output is a string rather than a slice of bytes. So you're kind of stuck there. I think that's one of the other big things that needs to be changed. The fact that slices of bytes and strings are so identical, but also so separate that you have to have the whole bytes package and the strings package that are duplicated. And switching between those worlds is so expensive. It's, it's, I don't know, it's really gross. That happens uh, a lot because most most packages end up assuming you want to deal with strings. So your your package takes in your string and then it does a bunch of stuff as a byte slice with it and then returns you a string. But the problem is when we start gluing those libraries together, we have a crap ton of just conversion to and from strings and byte slices. I actually, um, I had a proposal a, a way back to kind of rechange the language and the whole standard library to assume that there was a type that meant uh, a readable view of memory that, so a string promises that nobody in the world can ever change it, including you. And a byte slice says you can change it and other people could be changing it. But there's no type that basically accepts either a byte slice or a string. So like I had a proposal back in the day to add uh, kind of a, a view of memory type. So you can write a function that accepted either a byte slice or a string and did some operation on it. But you weren't allowed to write to it, but maybe somebody else owned it. And so I actually I prototyped the whole standard library with it. And I, Russ even implemented it for a while. Um, or he implemented enough of it to decide he didn't like it. But I think that the docs are still online at like xgodoc.appspot.com. It's kind of fun to like look at what the standard library would look like if that type existed. Oh, that's interesting. So it would basically, it could accept a string or a slice of bytes. You just wouldn't be able to write to it. You could only read. Yeah, I had this uh, this mem package, and there was like a, a mem.rw type and a mem.ro type. And so the read-only memory type or the, the writable memory type. I'd be interested to actually see that proposal. Uh, I just, 
I just pasted a, a link in the uh, the Slack channel to the uh, the docs for it. All right, everybody, want to do free software Friday? I'm going to take silence as a yes. Yep, let's do it. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was I was muted because of all of the various saws in my house right now. All your construction. <laughs> yeah. So uh, every week we kind of like to give a shout out to projects or maintainers um, of open source software to show the love. So this week, Carly, so you want to kick it off? Yeah. So this week I want to give a shout out to the changelog website. It's a really, it's a, it's a piece of art. And I especially wanted to give a shout out to Jared because he is the main lead on that project. And I especially love the search feature. It makes me so happy. If you are a listener and you are interested in any subject related to Go, you can go to the, to the changelog website, to the GoTime website, and do a search for that. And there might be one or more episodes that talk about that. It's fantastic. You might find uh, reference to it on the show notes, or you might find episodes that talk about that topic. Nice. How about you, Brian? Well, I've done this one before, but I'm going to do it again because it just makes me happy. Buffalo for web development. You just cannot knock out a website any faster in Go than you can with Buffalo. And somebody asked me in the Buffalo channel on Slack today uh, whether anybody had had any production use. And I thought, gosh, I've had that uh, GopherCon website in production since since the beginning of the year. The Gopher Academy website, the Gopher Train website. I've probably got five or six uh, Buffalo websites in production, and they're all just humming along so beautifully. So. Uh, it- it seems Yay like the GopherCon and Gopher Academy websites are staging environments for any cool project written in Go. It's like <laughs> we had we had Caddy running like way way early. It should, we shouldn't have had it in production. We're like, ah, let's launch the GopherCon website with it. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, did I? I have a good eye for picking these things out. I'm telling you. And we had we've had Hugo, some other some yep. other CMS stuff. Yeah, Anzu. And then how about you? Brad, did you have anybody you want to give a shout out to? Oh, uh, no, I'm uh, I'm busy reviewing Carlisa's uh, code review. <laughs> <laughs> Ship it. Ship it. It worked. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I didn't have one this week because I haven't been doing a whole lot of new stuff, but I'll just give a shout out to all the people who are contributing um, libraries for uh, sensors and things like that for Arduino. Because uh, on last minute notice, Brian and I were able to throw together something very quickly. Um, to stream barbecue data when we did the whole pig. <laughs> that was so awesome. It was epic. Best Easter ever. I love some of the, the, the conversions, though. I think that I need a CRC between the chips because uh, I don't think like 4 billion degrees is a thing. <laughs> that's how you get the caramelization in the skin. Right. That's, that's like ultimate searing right there. <laughs> We are so past time, and we're not going to talk about the Docker name change. No. No. We're not talking about the Docker name change because we don't (laughs) want Brian's blood pressure to go any higher than it already is. Let it go. (laughs) All right, then. All right. So with that, big thank you to everybody on the show, especially thank you, Brad, for coming on. Yeah, no problem. Huge shout out to our sponsors for today, TopCal and Datadog. Uh, definitely share the show with fellow Go programmers, coworkers, friends. Uh, you can subscribe by going to gotime.fm. We are at gotime.fm on Twitter. Uh, if you have suggestions for topics, questions for guests, want to be on the show, hit us up on github.com slash gotime.fm slash ping. And with that, goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Brad. Yep. Yep. Goodbye. <laughs> All right, that wraps up this episode of Go Time. Tune in live on Thursdays at 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time at the changelaw.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at GoTimeFM. Special thanks to TopTal and Datadog for sponsoring this show. Also, thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner at thefastly.com to learn more. This episode was edited by Jonathan Youngblood, and the theme music for Go Time is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for listening.